yeah, thanks a lot. And by the way, because Fabric is new, like to be honest, there is a lot of stuff we don't really know. So it's uh, feel free, feel free to ask. Let me just uh, I've done I'm I made uh, three demos, but I have this uh, presentation. So uh, just, just some words, uh, you can just call me Mim and I'm been Power BI developer since 2016. Uh, before that, we use Power Pivot. I'm basically, I become like full-time Power Developer just like three day, three years ago. I'm a construction planner, so we build roads and gas plant and stuff. I have... Um, blog called Data Monkey, where I blogs about different stuff. Basically, uh, Power BI, but BigQuery, Google BigQuery, I'm a huge fan. I just added Fabric, yeah, opportunistically. Uh, Primavera, because that's my, I've been like planner for nearly 20 years, I think. And the bit of Looker and uh, anything about construction. I have this side project. Uh, it's a website that track <clears throat> Australian electricity price, and it's uh, yeah, it's not really real time. Like uh, there is a lag of five minutes because every five minutes you get uh, new data. And the irony is, it's not using Microsoft at all because when I started, uh, Microsoft offering was not appropriate. Obviously, you can't do anything with Microsoft, but the cost, because it's a personal project, uh, the cost was just didn't make sense. But using Google staff, it was nearly free. Not free, it cost me, I think, $4 per month. I'm pretty active on Twitter and on LinkedIn, so you feel free to connect. I put uh, the Python files in the presentation here, which I will ask maybe to share it later. So <clears throat> this is the first look at Fabric, but it's from not really from Power BI user perspective, but from Power BI capacity admin, which is a bit different. I try to be neutral, but obviously I'm biased because I want Fabric to work. If, um, if you are a Power BI user and Microsoft came and say, well, I will give you staff, to Power BI, so obviously you want the thing to work. If you are, I don't know, a professional data engineer, maybe you have different ideas, you will say, I don't have problem, I already have tools, so I don't need that. So I'm I'm a bit biased, so I want the thing to work. Uh, this presentation is just a personal observation, not facts. I give you example, I don't know if you, uh, if you watch Build, their big announcement was One Lake File Explorer, and I thought it's the best thing ever. But then later I learned that you need to pay for egress fees. Basically, egress fees, for example, if you have a file and you download it, you pay for it. You pay for the network. So my first reaction is One Lake is amazing, uh, the File Explorer. And after I knew this information, one lake file explorer is literally dangerous and we have to turn it off. Uh, Spark, for example, I don't like Spark. I think um, I think it's a great tool for big data. Like if you're dealing with, okay, maybe terabyte and more, but for small data, and I think it's just horrible. But that's just my personal observation based on some some stuff I knew at the time but then later I I learned that you can customize spark then spark is okay you can so I don't have like hard beliefs it's uh if, if you learn more stuff you change your mind and uh, uh, one thing it's preview it's not production reading uh, it's good to learn to do like a proof of concept and but there are a lot of bugs because it's new and they've done a lot of change and there are like performance bugs which are like the hardest part like uh, i will show it later 
there are some staff that will eat a lot of compute and that's not good. You don't want that. Uh, you want it, especially at this stage, I think it's important to provide your feedback. I know it's a joke when you say, just go to Power BI and put an idea, but for Fabric, it's different. For a simple reason is uh, the product team is nervous. They want this thing to work and you can literally blackmail them saying, if I don't have this, I will not turn on Fabric. And they listen because they want this thing to work. So we have leverage. Uh, later in two years or when this thing become popular, then they wouldn't care. So no, it's, it's, it's working well. Like we don't care about your feedback. But this period, like we have leverage. So try to use it. Uh, don't take criticism as dismissal. I think it's, um, I, this is my personal belief. I think it's the, back, the, the, the next big thing for data. And it's a remind me of Power BI in 2016, where there was that excitement and, you know, something big is coming and, and the PM listened to you. And uh, there was this um, joy in the community. I don't know how to, to explain it. I, I, I feel the same with, with Fabric. Uh, for Power BI users, just to make it very clear, uh, Fabric just give you more options. If what you're doing is working fine, especially if you have small data, and by small data, it means a lot. Uh, yeah, some people, like I put this on Twitter, they said small data means 10 gigabyte compressed, maybe, yeah. So, but the point is, <clears throat> if your Power BI is working fine, you don't need to change anything. You can just ignore Fabric and move on with your life and everything will be great. Like they didn't touch anything on Power BI itself. They added more options. And specifically for Power BI, they add something called Direct Lake, which we can talk about it later. So there is no, don't feel the pressure to, to change anything you're doing right now. Basically, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, this is the controversial part is uh, people I know in this presentation, they, they expect is what is fabric. I think uh, <clears throat> a better question is why fabric? And this actually is quite, this idea I stole it from, from, from an MVP on, on Twitter. I, I found it very, very clever. It's like why, why we have fabric and companies like Microsoft. <clears throat> They don't come up with new product just like that. It's always based on some context. So the first one is, and I remember very well, like in 2019 in uh, Ignite, I think the way it's pronounced, and they made this uh, big conference and big presentation. And there is that guy from Microsoft and uh, <clears throat> he said, like Synapse, uh, it's unlimited. And he said like petabyte in second, which is interesting. Like you can't have petabyte in seconds. Unless you have like a massive compute, which is not really, <clears throat> doesn't make much sense. So anyway, and then they compare to BigQuery and uh, I, if I remember AWS, and it's just, it's amazing, limitless and all this stuff. What happened is, it was just marketing and actually nothing happened. They they showed the product to, uh, someone told me offline is they show this product to some customer as a private preview. <clears throat> and the customer, there was like universal negative reaction. They didn't like it. So it was so bad that they had to <clears throat> basically to cancel the project and start start again. Uh, now you have to go to 2010, <clears throat> and this is a presentation from a professor called Andy. It's from uh, CMO University. You can search on on YouTube. Maybe I should add the link. Basically, by 2010, the industry decided that shared disk is the right architecture. 
they the first one who started this actually it started in 2000 with a system called MapReduce, uh, which was horrible but it has this idea of separating storage from compute and yeah later they copy hadoop and then hadoop uh, got replaced by spark which gave us like data preak and uh, and spark in in fabric but by 2010 <clears throat> the first one like really started this was uh, bigquery and it did just make sense is that uh, your compute and your storage are scaled independently because before when you have a server you need to buy like the server contain both the compute and the storage and if you want to let's say run a query you need always uh, no not run a query obviously if you're on query you need the server to be running like if you want to mm -hmm. save and just some data you have always the server running which doesn't make much sense but with the separation of compute and storage you can save your data independently from the compute then run the queries <clears throat> and this is what's called data lake that uh, data brick la later call it lake house so in fabric when we hear lake house this is not new it was literally stand like not a standard like people understood it in 2010 so it's it was already invented like 13 years ago then what you have, you have Power BI, which uh, I presume as user group, we appreciate that it's uh, has a massive success. Personally, I think one of the best software invented beside Excel. Then if, um, if you're familiar with Synapse, which is the enterprise data offering from Microsoft, it's not really a coherent offering. It's uh, as far as I can tell, it's just like a bunch of product and their same marketing name called Synapse. So the engine don't talk to each other really. Uh, their data warehouse. Uh, Francisco is requesting. Sorry, what's this? Uh, it's a question or? Uh, no, you can't have. Control. Uh, no, there is no question, man. Ah, all right, okay. Yeah. Yep. Go on. Yep. So, for example, the data warehouse in Synapse Analytics is called uh, Dedicated Pool, and they have Spark. But if you want, for example, you have like store, you have some data in Parquet. You can't really run it. You you can't really run a query from Dedicated Pool. You have to import the data. So the system really doesn't talk to each other. Uh, they have this system, which they still have, Synapse Serverless, which I really like, but it has a big limitation. You can't really write data. So it's only read only, which is not very useful. Like when, when you have a data warehouse, you expect the system to read and write. I know people will say, yeah, it's right, but it, it cannot overwrite. So it's really very basic uh, basic functionality in the writing aspect. Then you have dedicated pool, and it's a weird software. So dedicated pool, basically, if you're an expert and you know exactly what you're doing and you fine tune the system, it's very fast and a lot of people love it. It's basically using what we call shared nothing. And the shared nothing compared to the previous one, which is shared disk. Um, every node is independent and they just connect using a network. And it means first, like the the compute has to be on all the time. So it costs more. Uh, the second is if you're on a query that has data in multiple notes then what happened they start doing what's called uh, shuffling it means moving the data using the network which means it's slower the bottom line is i'm i'm power bi user or just call me an excel user i'm i have zero interest in 
the concept of distribution and all this stuff. I think it's the database problem, not the user problem. Like my expectation is I put some data on storage and then I just run query and it works. The rest is the, the data warehouse problem. And this model doesn't really work well with dedicated pool. Dedicated pool, you need to know what you're doing. Uh, this one, this is another lecture. And basically he showed all the, the modern cloud data warehouse offering. And you notice something, uh, there is no Microsoft. And some people will say, yeah, well, maybe you don't like Microsoft. That's not true because he said it on public, like uh, um, he keep repeating that the optimizer of the SQL server is the best optimizer ever. So obviously he's not biased, has no problem to say that. And the reason there is no Microsoft because Microsoft has nothing to show really in, in the cloud data warehouse. Uh, so I think there is a problem, like a lot of people thought that there is a problem. A lot of consultants thought that there is no problem and we're just idiots. So anyway, some people at Microsoft, yeah, appreciate that there is a problem and they come up with this fabric, which in my opinion, the, they made some not easy decision. So the first one, it's not even technical, is they merge the, the Synap organization and the Power BI team and they put under the same leadership. Uh, I don't know, there is this guy called Arun, I think, he used um, to be the, the head of Power BI organization. And now he's, he's the, basically the manager of both division and it's very it's very important to have just like one manager uh, the second decision they made it's they use parquet they use delta table that obviously it's based on parquet as the only storage system for the data warehouse that's like a big risky decision for a simple reason if you if you see, if you compare to the market, you, for example, you have Snowflake and Snowflake, they, they announced they are going to provide Delta using Iceberg. That is just an option. It's not the only system. Uh, BigQuery the same, they said they, yeah, BigQuery is solution, actually, it's silly. They're using Spark to write, but anyway. But um, for Fabric Data Warehouse, it's using only uh, Delta Table. So that's like a big decision. It's a great decision, but it's not, it's, it's not that simple because it has to work. And one of the issues is that, <clears throat> okay, people will say Databrick is using Delta too, but it's like a joke. It's uh, trying to be funny here. Like Delta, Delta Brick doesn't know better. That's the only system they have, so they don't really have a choice. But Microsoft, they 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 did have a choice. I personally I was expecting them to use something proprietary and just do some kind of replication on real time, but they went with Delta. So like that's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, the other option to make it work is fabric bursting, and we'll talk about it later. So this is the architecture they they come up with. I uh, I like this diagram a lot because it's very it's very simple. And uh, yeah, so the first thing is they. Um, all the engine will use the same storage layer. It's not implemented everywhere, but at least that's the idea using Delta. Uh, the second one, as you will notice, like 
we have at least four engines. Is it good, bad? I don't know. If uh, if you ask Databrick, they will say all you need is one engine. If you ask Snowflake, you say one engine. Personally, I don't. I have a mixed feeling. I don't think it's a problem at all, and the pricing will will tell us if it's if it's good or not. And there is another school of thought is that you can't really have one database that's optimized for all different workload. So we'll see, but really what matter, what this, the factor that will decide if it's good or not is the pricing. Uh, the one security is, is not available yet. So what does that mean is the, for the lake house, the security is based on the workspace. So yeah, uh, I will show it later, but you can't really have one lake house you can't like assign people to one lake house and assign different people to another lake house. Basically, you need the your the lowest level of security. I think it's the workspace, which is fine. So it's just for uh, we have this direct lake. We'll talk about later. I think in this presentation, if you have really to take just one takeaway, is this one: when the engine is read, like who cares? That's not a problem. But when you write. You have to make a decision. Either you write using SQL or you write using Spark. And it's different. If you write using SQL, you cannot overwrite, like you you cannot have two engines writing to the same table. So you need to pick just one engine. Reading is not a problem. You can read using any engine. Uh, the thing with this architecture, because here it's, uh, as you can see, it's um, open storage. Yeah, is there any question? No. Uh, no, no question. Yep. Good. Uh, yes? No, there is no question, ma'am. Ah, all right. Okay, yeah. okay, good. Sorry, man. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. It's all right. Uh, what they said that um, they may add more engine. And Amir, I think he said public, that there was this live stream with Guy in the Cube. I think he said they may add, add SQL Server or or a server, some kind of uh, some kind of OLTP or, or something. So this is fabric bursting. Just to be very clear, uh, we don't know the detail of how fabric bursting will work exactly, like the fine detail. But the, the the concept it's clear, like we know the concept. So basically, in uh, in if uh, if you have like Power BI Premium, you know how it works. You 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 buy a fixed compute, and then when you have this, uh, you see here I'm using more than 100%. This is like some Spark stuff. Uh, the idea is that they will just smooth it and take this and just distribute it here on this. Uh, Okay, where is my mouse? On this uh, on this area, obviously the that's that's just the concept. It's more complex. You have some background jobs. So, for example, the if you run Dataflow or you run Python as a schedule, then it's considered background. But if you interact with a with a visual, that's uh, that's Power BI. It means it's interactive. And interactive is different. Like when you reach 100%, uh, they will throttle you, like make it slower. But the idea is, I don't, I don't really know the the exact detail because it's not announced. But their idea is very simple. Like if um, if a database, if you want, like let's say you run a query from SQL database, and obviously you wanted to finish as soon as possible. <clears throat> what they are going to do, they will use the, not the maximum, they will use as as many as the, the query optimizer think it's needed to give you back your result. So potentially you're going to use more resources than when you have. So if you buy capacity and you have, let's say, just four cores, the, the engine may use more, but then you'll pay it later. So the model is, I just come up with this silly name, it's just uh, use now, pay later. 
and it works very well in Power BI Premium. But there is a catch is that if you if you buy capacity that's uh, pay as usage, so basically you pay only what you use and you run this big query, like this massive job, and then you turn off the capacity. Obviously, you are going to consume more than more than your capacity. Are you going to get back charged or not? That's the interesting question. Uh, we don't know the answer. So for the license, uh, it's only capacity. So it does like fabric doesn't mean anything for pro. If you have like pro license or PPU, so like no like. Uh, Fabric is like different product. If you buy capacity, like you have three options. So the premium, which is the PSQ that we have right now, I think it's the best option because simply it, it has one bill guarantee. Like whatever happen, if you buy P1, it's $5,000 per month done, fixed. Like the worst that happen is that Monday morning, your report will be slow but you will not get overcharged or anything. Uh, there is the second model, which they call pay as you go, or serverless. Actually, it's not serverless. That's, uh, that's not really true. For a simple reason, there is no real automation. I know you can put some clever script on, on Azure just to suspend and resume, but the catch is there is no way to know what kind of workload is inside Power BI. And as far as I can tell, there is no way to know if there are like queries, tax query coming to Power BI, and then you capture that and you say, okay, just go and start the capacity. <clears throat> so it's not, um, it may work, for example, if, um, if you want to say, yeah, I will just turn on my capacity from A to five and then turn it off then yes, but it's not really Snowflake where when or BigQuery, when the query arrive, it will start when the query goes, it will just uh, sleep. No, that's not, that's not really the model. And still, we don't know if you overuse your capacity, like are you going to pay for it or not? That's a known. My feeling they put this pay as a go because they have to do it. And they will say, yeah, yeah, we have this model. But I think that's not the model they want you to, to use. So from my perspective, I want the PSQ. That's what I want. Uh, the FSQ pay as a go, they have to do it because that's an option. And they, you know, Gartner and the market, they expect this. But really what they want, they want you to buy the, the FSQ reserve instance, which is basically pay as you go, but it's uh, the same as PSQ. They will give you a big discount and then you have, you do a commitment for one year and then you pay per month. But there is a catch. There is a difference between the PSQ and the FSQ reserve instance. You will get different bills. So you will get a bill for, obviously the compute is fixed, but you will get another bill for storage and you get a bill for egress fees and you get bill for storage transaction. Tra storage transaction is basically <clears throat> if you list, um, if you run a query on some files on, on a folder on a bucket, then the system need to list those uh, directories and file and you pay for it. If you read a file, you pay. It's a, it's a very small transaction. They keep saying it's a small. Yes, it's a small, but you you have to manage it compared to to the PSQ. And obviously they, if they had another service layer later, like who knows if they add a service or LTP, they may say, yeah, yeah, you start paying for um, SSD storage or, or whatever. Uh, for the license, the, so you see here the different um, SQ. Uh, it starts from two core, like two compute unit till 2048. Don't um, 
when we say two compute unit, don't think of it. It's like two cores. It's just equivalent of something. It's just think of it's a unit of compute. And is it really two core or not? Uh, that's not actually. It doesn't even make sense because the engines are not the same. So you can't really unify. It. Like Spark VM is totally different from Analysis Service VM, which is totally different from uh, Data Warehouse. I guess actually, I'm not sure about Data Warehouse because no one knows what kind of VM they are using. But I I think you get the idea. Uh, for the the capacity, I th there is a big difference. So if um, for the F64 is like the key, that's the and in the initial feedback, a lot of people said you should give different name for F64 and up and, and F32 and down because it's only from F64 you get the free Power BI readers, uh, which is the equivalent to uh, Power BI P1. So here you get the compute and you get free readers like we have with premium. It's a big difference. So in this is my my personal opinion. I think for F64 and up, I think it's a unique uh, unique offering in the market. Like no one has this this offering. Uh, you can, yeah, you can. The, the expectation is um, for me at least, but not for me. For a lot of people who follow Google, is we were expecting Google to do something like that. And the irony, Microsoft started first, which is quite uh, interesting. But keep in mind, the number 64, it doesn't mean, it's not something technical, it's just commercial. Like, uh, who knows, maybe in three, four years, Microsoft will say, oh, do you know what? Uh, you get free readers starting from F16. I doubt they will do it. But you get the idea. There is no like technical limitation. This they just decided that we we'll, we we'll start give you free readers from F64. I know just to make equivalent to P1, but it's not technical. It's not technical decision. It's uh, just commercial decision. Okay, so we talk about the the reason I started first the license. It, just to curb your enthusiasm. Like if you have, if you don't have premium, then fabric doesn't mean much to you. Like it doesn't exist. So we talk about the license. We spoke about the bursting and then big uh, <clears throat> decision they made is Delta table, which is the table format. Uh, del like the table format, it's not, it's not something new, and it's not. It was not Delta. Actually, it was created by um, by Databrick. So there are a lot of options. <clears throat> Some of them are open source. So Delta was done was invented by Databrick. Uh, Iceberg was invented by Netflix. Probably you're asking like why Netflix should do that, and actually, the contrary. The, because Net Netflix they have a lot of data. And they get like a lot of logs back from their user. So they had this uh, massive data in, stored in AWS S3. And they, to fix that, they, had, they, they need to come up with that uh, table format. That's why like, I have some, I don't like Iceberg just because the inventor is, is not software, is not a data warehouse vendor. It's, it's just the romantic comment, it has, it's not technical. At the same time, there was a proprietary format, so which they work more or less, not more or less, actually they work exactly the same as the, the open source. So Snowflake use uh, something called PAX and BigQuery use cap Capacitor, I think. Uh, I put a link here. If you have to learn only one thing about Delta table is that when you save your data in, let's say you save a file in your disk, you can save the file, just open the file, modify it, for example, and save it again. This is not how object store works. So 
the, the one lake is using an object store, which is Azure Storage. It's very cheap and rather slow. Uh, the throughput is rather slow. It's not as fast as your disk, as your SSD. And which is fine because it's cheap, so who cares? But it has an interesting, actually I was quite surprised when I learned about this the first time. You cannot modify files. All you can do is add or delete. You cannot open a file, let's say text, open it and save it again. When you save it, it will create another copy, but you can never alter or change an existing file. So this is an example of a Delta table and Delta table is simply, this one is, let's say the folder line item. <clears throat> so it's a folder with logs, JSON logs and Parquet file. So that's, that's it. That files in object store. I know I'm just repeating myself, but it's, uh, cause I found this concept quite, Initially, I found it quite hilarious. Like, why would anyone use this as a storage system? And the only reason is when something is so cheap, people find workaround. It's very, very, yeah, to tell you about the human nature, I guess. So when you delete, it will add files. When you update, it will add files. And when you append, it will add files. Then why it's important to know? That's why I told you like using Delta as um, as as a base for the um, storage of data warehouse was an uh, interesting decision. Is that every every time you insert, let's say, every you delete or you insert one row, which you shouldn't do because it's not really good practice. Every time you do it, it will create file. Then imagine like. Uh, 10 people doing this at the same time, you will end up with quickly, you will end up with like hundreds of thousands of files. And that's bad for a simple reason that the, the object store, by the way, uh, the reason like if, if you hear Microsoft, they, they only keep talking about uh, Azure storage, like something special, but this concept is the same. It's the same as in Azure or Google Cloud or AWS, they are all the same. So reading a lot of small file is a problem. The solution is you need to compact those small file to a bigger file. Uh, keep in mind when you compact, obviously you're just going to create more file. Um, maintaining this is not really interesting. It's, it's nice to know it, but once you do it once and why? Then you say no. That's not. You shouldn't. You shouldn't care about this stuff. That's why, like, uh, cloud data warehouse, like Snowflake and BigQuery, just do it. You don't. It. It just. Uh, they do it behind the scene, and the Fabric data warehouse that do the same, but not Spark. That's why it's important to remember. Yeah, I actually I will show this in. Just, uh, Yes, so for Delta, the what I was showing before, which is like uh, every time you, you delete, it will create new file. It's called copy on write. It's basically when you copy something or delete something, it will do it on the on the writing. Uh, there is another option, it's called merge on read, which uh, it's a bit more clever is that, for example, you have a table and you want to delete one row. So instead of creating a new file without that row, because this is how Delta works, <clears throat> what it does, it will just add small file, literally like a log and say, that row is to be deleted. So it will just delete, tag that, that, uh, that row. And then what happened later when you when you want to read it, you will read the the base parquet file and read that file. Let's say don't read that particular row, and you combine them somehow, and it will give you the correct result. 
initially I thought that was a very clever idea, but I still think that the, the first one is better and it's simpler. For a simple reason is like I do BI stuff. I don't care about the complexity of the write. That's the data engineering problem. For me, I want the read to be as fast and easy as possible. The thing is with uh, with data, there is no free lunch. Like you have to pay the price somewhere. I think it's much better to pay it on the on the right step than to pay it on the read. Just for selfish reason, because when you read, you want to, you want that sub second. But when you write, who cares if it take one minute? Uh, yes, this one is very important. Like. Because when you see this folder, you will say, okay, who cares? This is only Parquet file. It's not. Like, Delta is not Parquet. If, um, if you say, I will just read those Parquet and ignore the log, <clears throat> you will get wrong result. For a simple reason, because the, the way the logs works, the log will, will tell the system that this file is good, use it, and I'm, I'm just making up just an example. So this file is the, the correct one and the rest ignore it. So when you read it using the, the log, you understand that the data is only the valid data. Is only in this file, but if you think you are smart, you say, OK, I will just read everything. You will get wrong result. So it's very important that. That you don't. Yet. Uh, I will show example later, like why Microsoft, like in in Lake House, you can see the the parquet and the log. Some people think it's a bad idea. Some people think you shouldn't show those files. So I I don't know. There is like pro and cons. Yes. So uh, enough of this uh, these talks and stuff. Let's just. Uh, it's not really a demo. Yeah. By the way, if. If you are a capacity admin, like if you are a user, like who cares? You just run query and everything works. If you are a capacity admin, this is like your nightmare. This is your, because you want this not, actually this one is already bad because it's more than 100%. Basically what you want, you want the system to work. So this is our worry. And Fabric, I'll show it later, is don't have like full picture yet. Uh, all right, so let's just close this. I do have yep, a question yep. regarding the P1 and the five thousand uh, yep. dollar fixed monthly thing. That's yep. that's like the equivalent of the Google product, right? Where they on BigQuery we have a fixed price BigQuery solution versus pay as you go, right? Where we we get a fixed price, but it just becomes slow versus getting everything as fast as possible. Is it is that the equivalent? Uh, the yes, but. That's that's a clever question, but it's not really because the with um, the P1 you get the BI. It's like in terms of Google, like so you get Looker and uh, the, the data warehouse and the data flow all bundled together, and that's unique to to Fabric because in Google. If you want Looker, you have to pay for Looker separately. Actually, it costs 5,000, which is quite hilarious. But there is no unified offering, and that's really unique to, to Microsoft. Do you know how much is the uh, the P the P uh, 64? Was it F 64? Was it? Ah, yeah, the, the F 64 is the equivalent of the P one. So, okay. yeah, but, yeah, there is a confusion like. Uh, uh, premium is fabric. It's literally the same thing. Actually, it's the other way. Actually, fabric is premium. They, it's just the marketing naming. So when you buy P1, you have already 64. Uh, it's the equivalent of F64. Absolutely the same. Uh, let me just show this delta table thing. I, I know if it's uh, I, I have an obsession because uh, with it because initially when I when I start I found it weird. 
like how deleting a file will just create more files. But apparently this is how Delta works. So, uh, so we'll show example. So this is the, the lake house. Uh, the lake house is just uh, it's just a bucket with a nice user interface. That's it. But uh, Spark is on by default. So I think there is a, there is a catalog. So for example, here when I run it, it will end, like it already knows that those are Delta table. So I will just run this uh, select from. It will take up to 15 seconds to start, to start Spark. Now, why they are using Spark for, the, for user interface, that's, I have no idea. I heard they tried to replace it, but uh, we'll see. Ah, come on. That's why I hate doing presentation. It used to take 15 seconds. All right, 40 seconds anyway. So, so yeah, it's a select. There is nothing special. But if you go here and you see the table, which is, uh, uh, if you go to the lake house, you know, it's funny. You have to switch the user interface in order to, you cannot have it stop at the same time. So we're searching here on nation and you can see here nation show the file. So one parquet, one log, one JSON. So when we delete, I will just uh, try to delete uh, the raw core China. Yep. So what do you expect? Like um, in my naive understanding, you know, I expect that somehow the engine will go and open Parquet and delete. And uh, now this is not how it works. It will. You see, it, it created a new file, new parquet file, and that new parquet file, yeah, unfortunately, currently I cannot show preview. Uh, it's not supported. And it will create another entry here. So this is the way uh, Delta works. And that's why, like, for example, you don't want to do like a very small transaction, like very small deleting row by row. Because imagine if if you delete thousand, but not 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 on a batch like row by row, it means it will generate thousand file, and imagine like ten people doing it, or well, let's say one hundred. So we're talking one hundred thousand. So something simple will just block the whole freaking system. So so yeah, this is the way uh, Delta works. So I just showed, um, yeah, there is a difference here. Uh, you decide between the lake house and the data warehouse. If you go to Microsoft documentation and they will show you, yeah, all kind of marketing material. But in, in my opinion, the, the main difference is that you can't, you need to decide what, which engine will write and what's the best one technically is the cheapest. But because we don't have usage statistics, we we don't know which one is the cheap. So uh, I'm probably repeating here. So the the engine that read like who cares? The engine that write decide either it's Spark or. And then there is this concept, which they don't talk about it too much, and I think it's very important. In uh, in Fabric, there is two types. Either the table is managed versus unmanaged. What's mean managed? Like uh, 
when you write a table using the SQL engine. So just uh, let me just show you the SQL engine. Probably it's better to than. <coughs> Yeah, reflex. I didn't ask you. So you see here the I have data warehouse. I have my data set, which is power uh, default data set generated by the warehouse. And you have my pipeline. You see there is no lake house. So here the way I am ingesting data, I am using a pipeline to write directly to my data warehouse. So for people coming from, say, BigQuery with Snowflake, this is like the native table. This is this table is managed, and it's read only outside, outside of the data warehouse. So you can read it, but you cannot modify it. The only way to modify it is using the SQL engine. So this is what you call it's not special. This is what you expect from real data warehouse. Lakehouse is different. Lakehouse. So the way uh, I'll show you how I'm importing data here. Yeah, the user interface is a bit weird, so I can't. I'm using a pip uh, pipeline, and the pipeline all it all it does is just uh, importing data from Cloudflare. Uh, R2, just because it's um, it doesn't pay for egress fees. Yeah, it takes time for to start. Come on, don't embarrass me. Yep, so. I import in from R2, I import in some file, and the, my destination is the data warehouse. So for someone who's coming from Snowflake or BigQuery, this is the normal way. So it's a proper, um, you cannot manually just go to the table and mess with it. The lake house is different. The lake house is, uh, it's not criticism, it's a good thing. Lake house is totally open. Actually, it's so open that, for example, here, this is all my lake house. I can just game and and just delete. Uh, it's not connected, so it will it will not work. But you get the idea. Or I can just add add more stuff just from the user interface. So for people, it's just they would say this is not serious. Like you can't you can't put your data and uh, the the keep in mind that it's uh, people who can delete. It's only people who have access to the workspace. So it's not like the the wide west. But the data warehouse is different. Data warehouse either you have access or not. No one can write to that table except the data warehouse itself. So it's more rigorous approach, I would say. Um, yep, so if you want something more strict, then I would say Data Warehouse is the way to go. If you are doing engineering, uh, data engineering, then use the lake house. And to be honest, the lake house table is just a folder that just happened. It's not managed. Uh, you can just read or write by anyone who has access. Uh, there is some kind of, uh, if you have like multiple writer, there is a guarantee, but only if you use a Spark. You can use other tool to write, like for example, use you can use Python to write to uh, to the lake house, just without uh, Spark, but I don't think it's supported. And the table maintenance, it's your problem. So in previously I said about this compaction and small files and make it like, uh, compact the file and all this stuff, that's not automated. So that's your problem. Uh, so what to use? I, I, that 
I don't know. That depends on your specific case. Uh, the pricing will be factored when we know about the pricing. Probably you guys asking like, but you said we have the pricing. So what do you mean? We don't know. Uh, so you see this uh, usage. It does not show the usage of the data warehouse. But for now, so they're giving us basically data warehouse for free. So we don't know. And if if the data warehouse end up eating a lot of resource, then it's a problem. But we don't know for now. OK, so. But I suspect. One approach is to lend your data in a folder using the lake house. Do your transformation using Python or whatever. And then load it in a proper data warehouse table. Keep in mind. Both are still delta table. But not all delta are equal. Some delta are more professional than others. Like the, uh, yes, probably a lot of just to answer about the performance. We can just show from random performance here. So if you go to. By the way, I love Microsoft. They gave us all this free compute. So I've done like I ran like three thirty thousand query and just totally for free. So yeah, I, thanks Microsoft for the free compute. So uh, if we go to show your result here. So this one is CPC 100, which is uh, 600 million rows, and uh, it's uh, it's like 10 gigabyte. It take I don't know to count, maybe like 20 seconds for the, the the SQL endpoint to load. Keep in mind it's only like three weeks old, so. Uh, like So we we run this the the fastest TPC in the market is Snowflake, I mean like the cheapest. And this is not personal view like I've tested because Snowflake performance is just amazing. Actually, it was so fast that I I thought they're cheating. Now they're not cheating. So and. Uh, so the reference is for this test using the same data, like you need to get like under three minutes. If you get under three minutes, then it's great. The problem is, we'll just leave it. The problem is like for how much compute, what's the price? If, uh, for example, Snowflake use eight core to get this number. If Fabric use 64 core to get the same number, then we have a problem. But actually, who cares if Microsoft pay for those extra? It's uh, it's only not only pure performance, but like uh, price compared to uh, I don't know what to say. So yeah, it's basically the cost to run a query. That's really what matter. It doesn't if it's uh, very fast but expensive, then it's not very interesting. If it's good enough and cheap, then it's great. So at this stage, we don't know much about the data warehouse internal. Uh, we, we know it's uh, it does separate storage from compute. That's for, for sure. And how I know it, because the first run is very slow. And yeah, the it seems for there is at the workspace for people doing Power BI, there isn't uh, the natural isolation is the workspace. So every workspace will have a different endpoint. It's not like BigQuery uh, where you have a global endpoint. Like BigQuery doesn't even, there is no concept, like the, there isn't really concept of multiple endpoint. It's uh, you connect, you see all your project. So I know it's a Power BI presentation, but let's just see the. So if you go to BigQuery and or if you connect to BigQuery, 
BigQuery is just like Gmail. It's always running. It's always there for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, I, I'm a huge fan of BigQuery. I just, but having said that, I think Microsoft, uh, Google just messed up everything as usual. So you, you have your, yeah, so you have all those projects. Some projects are not even mine because I just got access and it's only one global view. So one endpoint, and you get this um, this data, and you can like cross cross query, which you can do here. So yeah, okay, this one finished. So it took two minutes, thirteen seconds. That's impressive. That's banana. That's great. But there is a catch. We don't know how much it did cost. And there is no way to see it now. So it's very important to don't be too excited. Uh, so this is just observation. It's uh, like the second run. I don't even know from where it's running. Is it some cache? What kind of cache? Is it like, uh, for example, if Snowflake used the SSD of the node? We don't know what Fabric is using. And I asked the PM like a very direct question I, they don't want to answer. They said, yeah, it's a cache. What cache? And they just go away. They don't. Uh... So I don't know. But technically, we shouldn't care. Like, honestly, this is just like um, if you interest in database and stuff. As long as it's, hopefully, it will be cheap. So no one care about those technical implementation. But there is one thing for sure. The user experience is just, spectacular it's extremely simple so and this is again is unique like you, you you create your and the way you create it it's uh like it's really trivial you just came here new and you go to where is that our house And you just name it. And that's it. It will create one. And not only that, and then it will create semantic model. So let's just show this one because it's more um, it's more interesting. Oh, do you know what you'll say? No, it's not it's not like sub second. It will There we go, fail to load. Yes. Uh, guys, I told you it's it's uh, there are a lot of bugs, so. I'll just refresh. Yep, so you have the the choice. Either you use a pipeline or you write uh, SQL. And when you write SQL, you can just say copy into from and use the file that were already in the into the lake house. So yeah, just to tell you like it's uh it's really easy. It's not uh Maybe I will skip those. Uh, yeah, but this is just like a general rule. It's not specific to uh, to fabric. Uh, you can't. There is no magic. You can't have it all. So you have to compromise. Um, if you want something very fresh, then the, the cost will increase and the latency will increase. If you want something. The latency, like when you just click, just uh, show up result, then it cannot be fresh. So there, there is no, you have just to compromise. Like whatever you decide to do, you have to compromise. Um, the direct lake, 
Let's just show the demo first. I put like uh, this GIF just because I like the, because it's hard to reproduce, but here it show it. So you see like when it's ready, the data is already in memory. See here, it starts getting slow. So here I'm not even sure uh, it's either it's importing to the memory or it's using the, the fallback. And boom, like you have an error because it's using SQL Server. Uh, th there was an error in. So here the idea is that direct, direct like the way it works, it just, it does import directly to the memory. So if the data, you see, when the data was in memory, it's, it's instantaneous. When it's not, it will take some time to import it into the RAM, and it may fall back to, to SQL. Uh, the falling back is a problem. So, VertiPack, it's still, like, it didn't change. It's still pure in memory system. It doesn't uh, spill to disk or, so the data has to fit into RAM. But the difference is the data is compressed. So if, if you have 100, let's say, gigabyte, if you can compress to 10 gigabyte then, and you have uh, your RAM is like 15, then it will fit and it works fine. But you, it cannot use more. It does not support out of, uh, out of core, let's say out of core or out of memory. So the memory has to fit. Uh, there is a trick here. If you buy, let's say, I don't know the exact number, but if you have like F64, you have a maximum of RAM, let's say maybe coming up with a number, I don't know, maybe let's say 32 or something. If you buy 120, uh, then you get 64. Because the VertiPack is, is RAM bound. So the higher skew, the, the more RAM you get. It's like, it's like import, but it's clever. It doesn't, uh, it import directly to RAM. And the reason why it's fast, because the problem with import is that because uh, you take the raw data and you have to compress it and sort it and all this stuff. That's why like uh, import take time, but with the uh, direct lake, the data is already sorted and cleaned and everything. So you just load it into memory. So that's really direct like it's uh, it's import but direct to to the memory. But it's clever. There are like uh, if you don't need the column, it will not be imported. Only the staff that's needed are imported. If if you have like data and uh, I don't go. But if, for example, you have data and it's not used, uh, the mem uh, the engine will just remove those column. But it's basically, but it has a problem. It, uh, and I have strong opinion about it because I had the same problem with BigQuery and BI Engine. Is that when you run query and both work the same, by the way, the BigQuery BI Engine and uh, VertiPack and Fabric Data Warehouse, nearly the same. The, the big problem is the, something called fallback, is that when, let's say you, you do a complex query and there is not enough memory or the query was very complex, so VertiPack doesn't support it, it falls back to the Data Warehouse. It, it becomes like SQL query. And in theory, it's great. In reality, it's horrible because you keep spending all your time and energy, like why? Because you know, like that our house will be slower. Then like nothing can beat pure in-memory database. That's simply physics. For simple reason, like the RAM is faster than SSD disk. So every time it falls back and decide why it's falling back and people hate different uh, performance, like people expect when it's, Let's say 10 seconds, it's always 10 seconds. When it's less than five seconds, it's always less than five seconds. But they hate when it's like sometimes one second and another time is 10 seconds. They like consistency. And uh, so this fallback is, I just don't, don't like it. I prefer 
that's why I'm still like, uh, if your data is small, just stick with, with import. All right, there is a lot of talks and uh, the, it's only now, maybe I spoke too much. So I, I made this demo and basically I will show it here. So uh, it's the same thing. Uh, this uh, Australian electricity market and the way it works. So the government here, they're nice and they give us the data every five minutes. It's uh, public and anyone can use it. And you see here, new file every five minutes. And I'm using Fabric to load that data and show it in Power BI. And because it's Fabric, like you have a lot of options. So either either use data data flow with big uh, Power Query, or use Python, or use a shortcut. Shortcut basically it's a connection to an existing storage uh, in Azure. And then once it's there, both are using Delta. You have the choice either uh, you import it to Power BI or use Direct Lake, which I'm using in this example, or Direct Query. Uh, direct Query obviously it needs a server, not need the need the SQL engine. So it's it's uh, it's up to you, either import or Direct Lake. The uh, this demo, like I built it initially to show something like what's the best option. You're asking like, why should I use Python or Dataflow? And the theory was that the cheaper option will be better. But unfortunately, till now we don't they don't show the usage, so I cannot tell. So. This is uh, the Python, Python code. So this is the code that uh, read the file from the web and just save it. All it does is read that here and detect the new file and save it in the as a delta table. And I had the code already existing, so I didn't have the. This one was written four years ago. But it's um, it's joyful. Like before, the only way to run this was outside of Power BI. But now the fact that we can run it, like don't take my rent. That uh, it's uh, it's fantastic. But you have even the option to do it. Before you couldn't at all. So. So yeah, this is the 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 workspace. Uh, so where I have the pipe, the pipeline, and the pipeline, what it does, it will run those. Uh, I run both at the same time, a data flow and uh, a Python. It will take some time. I don't know why it's taking so long. By the way, this is uh, this is a bug. We shouldn't see this. This is generated by Dataflow, so we shouldn't see it. So this is already a problem. Uh, the default data set generated by by the lake house. Uh, currently, there is a bug. It does not refresh, so I have to build a new data set. That's the reason you see here. There is two data set. So already in this example, there is two bugs, but this one is more dangerous. I will explain, I will show you why. If you give me a second. Yeah, so the notebook is very simple. I'm, I'm just running notebook and then running data flow and getting this nice, uh, nice report. Yeah, you see it's five. I'll explain to you like the 
like direct lake is still weird it doesn't um it doesn't update always you notice here like it's quite interesting give me a second Yeah, like here it did work, 9.25, we here it's 9.28. I don't know. But when I go and refresh it, you see here it's got stuck because here it's 5 p.m. The idea is when you refresh, then keep in mind, this is direct like. So when I say refresh, I'm not importing. I'm just uh, loading the data directly to the run. But keep it, Again, like uh, this shouldn't exist in the first place. Like if the, the default data set was working, I wouldn't have uh, the need to use this at all. Let me just refresh here. The, uh, you know, sometimes. Uh, I don't know, usually it's faster. I don't know it's uh, why it's doing that. It's stuck for some some reason. But it's already weird that the fact that um, Yeah, I, I don't know why it's not updating here. But here you can see it's. Uh, it was 25, now it's 30, so it's working fine. Maybe Spark. Uh, uh, the third option here. I'm reading from. Basically, I'm. Uh, just for this presentation, I'm. I'm generating the data in Google Cloud and saving it in Azure storage and reading it from here. Uh, the reason it's slow here, because the, the small file problem, the, the file are not compacted, so the performance is not really that great, but it will, should work. Yeah, obviously there was a problem. Like it shouldn't take that uh, that long. Man, I had doing demo. Yeah, but I can tell. Like it's uh, I was yeah. Now you see it's uh, uh no, this one works always. Yes. So now we have Yeah, so it's 9:25. This one is already 9:30. So it's quite interesting. So there is there is a glitch somewhere. I I don't I don't know the the reason and this one is not uh is not even it's slow but this one i know why it's slow because i did not compact the let me just show you what i mean so 
So when you go to the lake house, you see this SCADA Azure. So this one, it's reading from Azure. It's not even like all the data are on. I'm just putting a link. So it's not copying the data. It just go into Azure and read in the data. And my, my initial for the presentation is just show the three, the three tools and say, this one is cheaper than the other. And hence you like use one of or the another. You see now it's working. But obviously it's slow, it's still yeah, th there is um, you know, like there is always some 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 issues. But think is it's using direct lake. All right, so this one, it's uh, the data is written from a Google function. It's saved in Google uh, in Azure storage, and I'm reading from Azure storage. And it's using Direct Lake. But the performance is a bit weird. But the good thing is uh, Vertipack can read from any Azure storage, as long as it's Delta. Here I'm using Dataflow Gen 2, and it's the same same result. And here I'm writing using Spark, but for some reason Spark is stuck. It's already delayed by five minutes. Why is that? No, we can check. I don't know. It seems to be working fine. Yeah, I I don't know. There is uh, it should be like nine thirty five, not uh, not twenty five. That seems to be working fine. So I I don't know. Uh, here I'm using vacuum, and uh, because when you write using Python. Then it's your problem. You need to vacuum manually. Here I just uh, I'm not using Spark. I would just like testing, but that's the this uh, this Python run every 24 hours. All right. So that was the first uh, demo. Like the takeaway is you can use different tools and uh, either Spark or either Python or Dataflow and see which one works better. Uh, Direct Lake is still in preview, so you may find stuff like this and which you notice. The other demo, this one is just talking about Spark. This is my feeling about Spark. I, I think Spark is a monster and just will eat your children. So I've run this test and these numbers is basically. So I'm using the data set, which is SF100, which is 100 gigabyte. Uh, the main table, I'll show you here. So if we go to benchmark yep so it's uh, eight tables and uh, the main one is called line item and the queries are relatively complex it's 22 different uh, 22 queries and they are pain and that's the whole point because it's a benchmark 
and I ran it like automatically. And I show the. So every workspace just keep running on a schedule and just uh, insert the result into that lake house in the benchmark. Which is uh, they inserted here in this in this lake house. In this uh, file. The file is not really that big. I think it. You see, for example, the uh, the engine when it's running the first time because it's called run. I think it's running from the remote storage. It's rather slow because the file is small. Like we're not uh, we're talking. What are we talking? It's like thirty thousand something. Yeah. 39 seconds, yeah, whatever. So every time a query ran, it will ingest the duration, the, the query number, which engine, either it's, uh, I'm using DuckDB or Spark or DataFusion, and the time it did run, and which factor, which is 100, and the number of cores. And I ran this for five days, I think. And then I got this result. So DACTP is running uh, using Spark Notebook. One thing about Spark Notebook is that the minimum, you cannot have one VM, you need two VM. So the first VM is called driver, the second VM is executor. But DACTP is single node, so it uses only one VM. So you are paying for two VM, but using only one which is horrible. So here for DuckTP, it's using 60, uh, you are paying 16 core, but using only eight core. And this is the, re the result, it got 536 second. And when you multiply this by the number of core, you get this number. And using like different combination for DuckTP and Spark and Data Fusion, uh, here the number of run, so I ran it 30,000 time. When you get free compute, you tend to do interesting stuff. And I got this result, and you see here to run the the test for using thirty two cores, it consumed a thousand uh, core second. Spark did consume fifty six thousand. That's uh, I don't know eight million seven times or. Uh, here, it's 89, 89,000, and DACTP consumes 20. Why you should care about those numbers is that because those numbers, you, like you, this is like the usage, you pay for it. It's not free because you have a limited uh, resources in your reservation. So if you use uh, an engine that's not efficient, it will eat all your compute and then what you get you get like power bi user that they're not happy because power bi user don't care about your spark efficiency they want a sub second response time and that's like one of the biggest uh problem or I would say challenge a different way of um of fabric so this I showed already. You, I keep talking about lake house and data warehouse. Probably you noticed that it's just uh, it doesn't really make sense. Like a lot of people just asking, and if you came from BigQuery, uh, it's basically the native table versus external table. Yeah, if imagine imagine Google making a whole product. Just because, uh, imagine like BigQuery for external table and BigQuery for native table. It doesn't make sense, yeah, because uh, it doesn't. A Spark is a problem, and ideally they 
I hope they will reduce spark footprint in Fabric because simply Spark is an amazing tool for big data, but it's a horrible tool for small data. And it's not necessary problem for Microsoft, but it's a problem for the user because we pay for it. Like we pay premium and we don't want to pay for this stupid GVM stuff. Uh, there are options. You can have Delta using just Python. I put a link here. I personally, we shouldn't pay for two nodes. And if the guys put Spark because they have client that use Terabyte, that's up to them to pay for it. But for us that use less data, like we don't need this Spark thing. Uh, simplify the ui and this one i can show you why it's a problem so again the fabric uh, <coughs> capacity metric like if you are power bi user like you wouldn't care but uh, if you are the admin like or capacity admin uh this is like his nightmare so here it shows you like how much uh, compute it did use. And there is a bug in the system. And I reported. So you see here this uh, this data set is automatically generated by data flow. It's a it's a bug. At least I hope. Because I don't use it like I'm I use a different data set. And it it's used 13 million compute second that's massive and the way you calculate it is 13 i'll show you like how to calculator so 13 million you divide it by to get uh, to the hours so right and the cost is 0 0.18 by compute unit hour so you multiply yeah 650 dollars i didn't pay for it but this is the equivalent of 650 dollars of compute that shouldn't be there at all because someone decided that default data set is a clever idea it's it's not uh yep and uh yeah there is not a problem as the workload isolation um uh, yes it's basically it's nice to have everything in one bucket so you can share resources between the different workload but the problem is there is no obvious isolation so if someone do silly thing with spark it may disturb your workload. Uh, I know they will fix it eventually. They have to. So some people are suggesting that maybe to make more sense to keep our BI separated. I I don't know, but that's that's an option. But the big one is the the pricing. Like don't just don't touch our PSQ. We don't want another bills or managing egress fees or storage or like uh, we're business user. We like to build a report and uh, and let's keep it that way because predictability is a big thing. Uh, like a lot of customers pay premium just to have the certainty to pay only one bill. We don't want to pay more than one bill. Having said that, like uh, Fabric was really enjoyable. That's maybe I. It's not impression I'm giving, but I like I love it. I spent the last three weeks just purely on on Fabric. I think that's something. And uh, my personal belief is the. Power BI made semantic model commodity. Like if you go in 2016 and say anyone can build store schema, people will say, no, that's crazy. 
but now in where 2023 and anyone can build it. I, I think Fabric will do the same for Data Warehouse. I think we'll just make Data Warehouse uh, just a commodity. Yeah, obviously, as long as you learn how to write code in SQL. So yeah, that's uh, the presentation. I hope it was useful.